morning. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the first presentation in this year's Databricks lecture series. I'm really glad that you could all join us. I'm Drew Pollan, the academic director of MIDS here at the iSchool. I'm very pleased to introduce Vinny Jaiswal, who will lead the presentation and discussion today focused on preparing and designing data lake houses for AI. Vinny is a developer advocate at Databricks and brings over nine years of data and cloud experience working with unicorns, digital natives, and Fortune 500 companies. She helps data practitioners to be successful in building on Apache Spark, Delta Lake, Databricks, MLflow, and other open source technologies. Previously, Vinny was City's VP Engineering Lead for Data Science, where she drove engineering efforts, including the one where she led the deployment of highly scalable data science and machine learning architecture on the global cloud. She also interned as a data, data analyst at Southwest Airlines and holds a, an MS in Information Technology and Management from the University of Texas at Dallas. Currently, she is co-authoring the book Delta Lake, The De Definitive Guide um, by O'Reilly. So welcome, Vinny. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, I want everybody in the audience to know that we're going to set aside 10 minutes or so at the end of the presentation for questions. So please do feel free to pose questions either in the Q&A panel at the bottom um, or in the chat, and we will definitely return to them at the end of the session. Vinny, you want to get started? Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Drew, for amazing introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for making time to attend this session. Uh, let me present my screen. Uh, all right. Drew, can you see my screen? Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, I love seeing people join. Um, in today's lecture, we will learn how to prepare and design the data lake house for artificial intelligence. I'm assuming you are taking data science course and you're interested in learning about artificial intelligence. So I'm here to talk about what are the latest innovations as well as the architectures I have seen uh, working with customers. Um, I am, as uh, Drew mentioned, I am Vinny Jaiswal, uh, developer advocate at Databricks, where I help data practitioners to be successful building on uh, Databricks and open source technologies like Apache Spark, Delta, and MLflow. Uh, I usually don't talk uh, about my career in detail, but I was asked by Tia and our amazing panel to go into a little bit detail to explain my career journey since it's a lecture for acad academia. Uh, working in airlines, flying plane was my childhood dream, but oh well, I switched my gears and being passionate with math, Throughout my schooling, I selected electronics and communication engineering as my undergrad. Uh, moreover, I chose this field because I was fascinated by the digital communication between satellites, how cell phones work, the evolution of cell phones from heavy cell phones to very smart lighter phones, um, and robotics use cases were becoming more realistic. Uh, to pursue higher education, I moved to Texas for doing masters from UT Dallas. Um, during, my, um, during the start of my semester, I came across a demo for market basket analysis and how Amazon uses it to recommend products on customers' purchase history. So upon my research, I found the world of BI super fascinating and interesting along with the advancements in the field of digital world. So I shifted my focus to do machine, uh, to do a master's in information technology and management with the major in data analytics. Uh, to further gain my practical knowledge, I started a data engineering internship at an audit firm uh, where we got the data from our retail clients in the form of magnetic tapes. Yes, that was a thing back then. Uh, we had a mini infrastructure or data center lab where we would host all the data in the server I would do the ETL from those tapes into the SQL server and create um, MS access reports for the auditors. So you see how my data journey started. Um, and earlier I did express my wish to work in the airline industry. So when I got a chance, I did a second internship as a maintenance quality control analyst, data analyst at Southwest Airlines, where I built a reporting tool using Southwest in-house technology and in its own proprietary data warehouse. 
I would pull data from legacy systems and various sources, including Access, Excel, Oracle, SQL Server, and so many Southwest enterprise data warehouses. Then I would work with quality inspectors uh, who would perform the maintenance records. And finally, after I have gathered all the data, I would do the quality report for the decision makers available in the form of dashboards. It was a very fun and interesting experience to work on the data for maintenance of the flights and providing intelligence around improving the quality of fleets. Um, so that was interesting. Soon after, uh, I had a variety of experience at, at City after my graduation. It was a long tenure at City. I started working on the infrastructure side where I would work on like data center projects, building labs, building a lot of uh, uh, desktop solutions. I was tasked with managing applications, which would go on around like 400,000 city devices. Um, I then worked on a project um, to move the city infrastructure from on-prem to cloud. That was a cool thing back then. Uh, cloud adoption was increasing. And after a good success, I transitioned working on building the data science platform for city internal businesses. Uh, while I totally enjoyed it, I wanted to expand my experiences uh, from the banking industry to a lot more verticals. And I, want, I was fascinated by um, use cases that people are uh, using AI and data science for. So as a result, I started working at Databricks uh, where I worked on at least 100 plus data and AI architectures for Databricks customers in the digital native, unicorn, commercial and enterprise segment and many industry verticals. And now I'm doing developer advocacy for lots of data and AI practitioners. I, can, uh, I want to help them uh, leverage the AI technologies, leverage the data and make intelligence out of it. Um, so that was my career journey. Um, this is in a nutshell what I showed you. I uh, hope I didn't bore you and uh, hope you're still with me. Uh, please do paste your questions in the Q&A and later, as Drew said, we will have time to answer a few questions. Great. Um, so after uh, I walk through my journey of data and AI, let's start with the topic that we are here for uh, on AI. I would like to start with a famous quote uh, from Mark Anderson, software is eating the world. Just as software has transformed many businesses and created new ones, AI will do the same. By definition, AI has been able to achieve tasks that previously wouldn't have been possible by manually writing software. However, we all know that most of the time that we spend in developing any AI application is focused on data and that without good quality data, AI just doesn't work. Data is the bigger beast uh, that is eating AI. And while may, uh, that may just sound like a catchphrase, there's actually a lot of truth to it. So I would like to show you some statistics. While the data is growing rapidly, you must have heard from Gartner reports or any other uh, uh, data reports, data is growing massively. Uh, it might grow, grow to 177 zettabytes by 2025. And only 80 to 90% of the world's, uh, only 10 to 20% of the data is learned from, while 80 to 90% of data still has not been learned from. So give yourselves a pat in the back for being here, uh, because you, you being here, you being AI enthusiast already had uh, solved some of the initial problems. We can multiply forces to bring intelligence from this data. So let's talk about the problems that people commonly encounter and why we haven't been able to leverage full potential of our data to make artificial intelligence products. So let's take a look at why the focus really is on data. I did mention about how our data is eating AI. So the main reason is that we have come really um, good at dealing with code and data separately but we are terrible at combining it. Uh, in software engineering world, the main goal is functional correctness. And in most cases, you can write good tests to ensure that um, you know, software is working well. AI, on the other hand, tries to optimize a metric. 
which can be a moving target with changing data. So one mistake I see a lot is that when a feature gets into the hands of customers, they don't think of it as the beginning of the process. They think about it as the end. And I see many teams make this mistake all the time and they build some data-driven feature, they release it, they find the performance to be mediocre, and then they either roll it back or abandon the project itself. And sometimes these organizations even come away with the mistaken impression that machine learning is therefore not actually very effective for, for the problem that they are trying to solve with their data. When in fact, they kind of quit at the beginning. So uh, that's, that's one of the things we see. Another factor is the outcome. So any outcome for a software is deterministic. Whereas in AI, the outcome of training a model can change significantly based on changes in the underlying data, uh, input variables, all of these factors combined make it painfully clear that AI is hard because it depends neither on code nor on data alone, but a combination of both. As a result, many different people need to get involved. Software is mainly about building um, you know, softwares by software engineers, but to train a machine learning model and deploy it in production, you usually like to involve combination of software engineers who build the platform, data scientists who will build the models, do the predictions, uh, do all sorts of like intelligence around it and data engineers who will build your data pipelines, who will curate your data. So what is lacking? There is no standard way for domain experts, data engineers, machine learning engineers, and IT operations to engage with, engage with each other. Lack of collaboration leads to project delays, low productivity, deployment difficulties, and poor real-time performance. So Getting all of these people involved and coordinating among them is a major challenge. Now, this is not uncommon, of course. Uh, some of the most meaningful problems can only be solved by bringing many people together. Uh, however, it becomes almost impossible if those people cannot agree on the tools that they want to use or they should use. In summary, we are faced with three challenges. AI is hard because of the interdependency of code and data, many people needing to get involved and a massive amount of components needing to be integrated. So what are the attributes to the solution? Let's look at it. So to do AI right, companies need an AI platform, uh, but before we dig in, how can an organization solve this problem? Um, let's take a look at what's the need for each of the bucket that we uh, categorized uh, in the previous slide. So to quell the challenge of data sprawl, the machine learning platform needs to be data native and open. What it means is that it needs a platform that allows discovery, access, exploration, preparation, and reuse of data regardless of what cloud you use or what data format you use, it should possess inherent quality checks, versioning, compliance, and governance capabilities, especially as the data evolves. You, it should provide all collaborating teams seamless access to the most recent data using familiar tools, and it should be easily uh, integrated with existing infrastructure. Uh, second, to make ML projects more productive, the machine learning platform needs to foster collaboration. We need to remove silos between data. We need to provide teams with more access. We need them to collaborate together. Um, and it should allow participants to use the tools, languages, and infrastructure of their choice. Brings together all teams involved. For example, we saw data engineers, data scientists, developer, um, um, developers and software engineers in one place to share, learn, and collaborate with each other. Uh, it should also securely facilitate any real-time interactions between people and teams so that they can accelerate the, um, uh, accelerate the projects, accelerate uh, the needs of um, uh, their infrastructure. And finally, the machine learning platform should support the full ML lifecycle rather than just a piecemeal approach um, 
to different parts of machine learning because you must have seen there are a lot of tools out there. So focus on the problems at hand uh, rather than focusing on tools. Uh, have um, trust in your data engineers. Give them love take uh, TLC uh, to build the tools they need. One more thing. Start small and iterate. The right way to build and plan um, for iteration is uh, going to bring uh, successful AI projects. You should assume that you're going to start out with something that works OK, and that uh, you will need to measure performance, collect more data, and iterate until it's good enough. You have to just keep on iterating. And that's partly organizational. Like, having the political will to invest that time and iteration, but it's also about how you develop. Uh, you need to put in place any of the instrumentation that will perform, that will inform the iteration process. For example, make the cost of training uh, each iteration of the model as low as possible and um, the infrastructure to support the rapid experimentation and iteration is really crucial. So. Uh, when you see organizations sort of floundering with machine learning, it's often because they don't have uh, enough resources invested in the infrastructure to make iteration um, easy. So let's look at how a typical end-to-end uh, -end data architecture looks like. Uh, on my screen, you can see that I have source data. It is either getting ingested as a batch or stream. What I mean by batch is you, in, you allow the data to be inserted maybe one, one, maybe one batch at a time. And for stream processing, it needs to be uh, continuous. So data engineers write the pipelines to make data available to downstream users. And downstream users might be either data scientists who are trying to implement machine learning or AI projects. Another downstream users can be data analysts who would want to write SQL queries or generate insightful dashboards to make important business decisions. And to facilitate all the data engineering processes, you will need a data platform where you can build the required compute and storage infrastructure because you got the data, you need to process it. So you need storage solution, you need compute platform. So have the data platform team worry about it, implement it proper security controls and governance around your data and infrastructure. For an alternate data provider, you might have to integrate it with client-facing application or maybe in some other in-house systems. This is where I, I was saying integration becomes a super important key. Uh, what if all of this is simplified as well as unified so that you don't need to keep your resources uh, for maintaining the infrastructure and start realizing value out of your data. Because the reason I say this is a lot of uh, teams actually invest a lot of their times in developing the infrastructure, capacity planning, working on what tools to use, this, that, and they, they have very little time spent on the end application that they are trying to build. Uh, so let me talk about how the data landscape has evolved from warehouses to lake houses. Uh, I'm pretty sure in the audience you are familiar with how data, uh, how data landscape must have evolved from data warehousing to data lakes and to warehouses. And before, uh, organizations were doing business intelligence, but they soon realized that they could do much more with the data. Uh, so they want to not only just do BI, but they also want to do machine learning and AI on their data. So here are two, uh, two different uh, evolutions, data lake and data warehouses. I'm going to compare it and then uh, give a unified solution. So data lakes and data warehouses have complementary but different benefits that have required both to exist in most enterprise environments. Data lakes do a great job supporting machine learning. They have open formats and a big ecosystem, but they have poor performance for business intelligence because they suffer complex data quality problems. Data lakes are literally like you can ingest all of your data, whether it's in uh, whichever format you want, um, it's not uh, managed well. 
but data warehouses are great for business intelligence applications uh, because they have a great manageability, but they have limited support for machine learning workloads and they are proprietary systems uh, with only a SQL interface. Uh, unifying both of these systems can be transformational in how we think about data. So what if we could borrow that is data management capability, uh, which is reliability, which brings reliability, integrity, security, quality from the data warehouse, and you could go get it, but it still should support all of your workloads. My use cases are now not just limited to BI. Uh, I want to do AI and machine learning on it. So if there's a best way to bring uh, best of the both worlds, it's Lake House. It, this isn't a dream anymore. We have a way forward and it's the Lake House platform. Um, since I'm working on Databricks, I have seen the evolution. Uh, Databricks fully embraced it and uh, created an identity for uh, data lake houses. So lake houses is effectively saying, I can bring all the data that uh, you have and uh, have the core data management capabilities of warehouse, a foundational compute service to support all the primary data lake use cases. So with the lake house, much more of your data can remain in your data lake rather than having to be copied into other systems. Because I say that um, in data warehousing, if you want to uh, leverage your existing data, use it in some other for uh, uh, in some other tool, you need to copy a lot of data. So there is a lot of storage cost involved. There is a lot of transfer cost involved. But with lake houses you can have data in one place so that you don't have to copy it over and over. You no longer need to separate data architectures to support your workloads across analytics, data engineering, streaming, and data science. And what this brings you is it removes data silos. Teams can actually come together and work from a single platform or get value from the single available data repository. Um, so this is why companies have started to use the lake house to provide one platform to unify all your data, analytics, and AI. So I will talk about Lakehouse architectures that I have used at Databricks. Uh, we start with data prep. So uh, I have three different tiers here. You can see data prep designed for ML, and then ML frameworks, and then deploy anywhere um, at scale. So your data can be in different formats. Uh, back back to uh, 10 years ago or so, we started working on structured and semi-structured data, but now we are talking more about how we can bring analytics or artificial intelligence to the natural data, which is like either in the form of video or audio. Um, so next comes the featureization. Featureization is the act of optimizing the inputs of machine learning model. And one of the tools I know is Databricks Machine Learning Feature Store, which has been co-designed with Delta Lake and MLflow. So not only does it benefit from the pristine data from Delta, but it also natively stores features with the model itself in MLflow model registry. I'm not really sure if you know about Delta Lake, uh, but we have a lot of talks. Uh, if you follow me on LinkedIn, I have a few talks on Delta Lake if you want to learn more about it. Basically, it uh, has changed the you know, data management capability in the big data world. It provides asset transactions, uh, which allows users to be, uh, users to feel that they have reliability for their data. Uh, so I will talk a little bit more about that in the upcoming slide. So once your data is in shape, you can train models using any of the ML library you want if you are in the uh, Databricks platform or elsewhere, um, if you're using a favorite tool of your choice, there are a lot of libraries available and there are a lot of open source contributors who keep bringing this amazing libraries uh, to make, uh, you know, uh, to make intelligence uh, pretty easy for, um, for your projects. So a Databricks runtime provides optimized uh, runtime for machine learning and it already installs a lot of packages on its own. So it's a very uh, it's a very powerful tool to check out. All you need to do is just work on your project, focus on your project. But all the infrastructure is handled by Databricks. Uh, and one more thing, 
for model deployment, it supports any and all deployment needs from batch to online scoring on the platform of your choice. And of course, if you are, if you have any favorite cloud, either Amazon, either uh, Amazon, Azure, or Google Cloud, Databricks supports all of them. So you can use any of the clouds with Databricks. Um, and then to productionize, once you have model deployment, once you have featureization, now you want to productionize and scale your ML pipeline. So users can also benefit from the ability to run the entire machine learning lifecycle in an automated fashion, wherein AutoML allows users to automatically generate the best models from the data. So uh, if you are new to AutoML, we have few resources, stay tuned. Uh, I will upload some resources if you need uh, to check it out. So ML operations is really a combination between developer uh, DevOps, um, model ops, and data ops. Uh, so that was the full ML lifecycle. Um, I hope it was a little clear to you. If not, we will have a demo at the end um, to, to show you what it looks like. All right, um, and then I want to say uh, with this foundation that we just looked at, um, Delta Lake has actually accelerated a lot of it. So let me show you how. If you are working as a data scientist, you might have your full modeling process sorted and potentially have been deployed a machine learning model into production using MLflow. But what if you could reduce the time you spend on data exploration? What if you could see exact version of the data used for development? What if the performance of a training job isn't quite what you had hoped for, or you are experiencing out of memory errors? You must have seen out of memory errors in the Spark, uh, if you leverage Spark. Uh, all of these are valid thoughts and are likely to emerge throughout your development of machine learning process. A key enabler behind this lakehouse innovation is Delta Lake. Um, so when a data practitioner trains a model on database machine learning, they know not only benefit from the optimized writes and reads to and from Delta, and because Delta provides asset transaction guarantees, they highly benefit from the, quali uh, the quality and consistency of their data pipelines. Um, and some other use cases, like you are waiting for a query to run um, is a common issue. And it only gets worse as the data volumes get increasingly large. Luckily, Delta provides optimization techniques that you can leverage, such as data skipping. As your data grows and new data is inserted into Databricks Delta, uh, there are file level min-max statistics, which are collected for all columns uh, of the supported types. And finally, if you don't know uh, the most common predicates for the table or are in the exploration phase, you can just optimize the table by coalescing small files into the larger files to gain some performance efficiency. So Delta also provides inbuilt uh, data versioning through its time travel feature. Um, through an integration with MLflow, customers can automatically track exactly which version of data was used to train a specific model. Um, and this is, a, this is a great capability. You use describe history and you exactly see the full data lineage, what has happened to the data uh, over time. So it can allow you to do governance, full tracking, auditing. Um, and also like, you know, whenever you are deploying a software, if something goes wrong, you always love to uh, have a capability of rollback when those incidents happen and Delta allows you to do that. Um, so an ML platform does, does need ML specific tools for data and features, but you really want these tools to use the same data management and security model used by data engineering and rest of your data systems. If you don't have that, you end up having to manage two different security models. You have to spend a lot of resources in managing different complex architectures and you waste time and money copying data between your data engineering tools and your machine learning tools. That's the gist of it. So you see how Lakehouse platform with Databricks has uh, provided uh, collaborative and um, reliable functionality to for your AI applications. All right. Uh, looks like that was too much. So let's uh, switch over to the demo and uh, I'm gonna switch my share.
All right. So if you can see my screen, I am presenting a Databricks notebook. Um, here, uh, I'm using Databricks for the demo, which offers an interactive working environment to process our queries. We do need compute, right, to process our uh, queries. Uh, so I'm using a Spark cluster. Uh, and as I mentioned, Databricks machine learning runtime has fully packed libraries already installed. So I don't need to worry about installation. I don't need to manage any libraries. It's all available for me. I'm just going to use that machine learning uh, runtime and I am good to go. And to start with, I am using the data from uh, Lending Club. So I'm, I'm going to show you how we are designing Lakehouse for classifying bad loans for a lender. And because um, you know, this lecture was about how you can prepare and design Lakehouse architecture for artificial intelligence, I will focus mainly on how you design the pipeline. All right, so as you see, this data is from Lending Club. Uh, we have gathered a sample data set for funded loans from 2012 to 2017, and each loan includes applicant information provided by the applicant, as well as current loan status, whether it's paid fully, whether it's current, late, and the latest payment information. Um, so I'm going to first do some, um, you know, some uh, environment setup. So here is where I have the Parquet files. My data is in Parquet files. Uh, it is getting generated um, in the database data sets. Uh, so as you can see, uh, we have uh, part files in the parquet. If you know the if you know the parquet uh, file format, using that file, I'm going to create a data frame so that I can use Apache Spark uh, uh, APIs to read my data. So this is the file path that I need to provide, and then I'm going to use uh, raw DF as a data frame where I'm reading the data from my file path here and then injecting it into um, my data frame. So I'm going to select the columns here. Um, columns here, which are loan, loan status, uh, what, is, what was the interest rate, how much is the revolving uh, utilization uh, per person on their credit, and then a few other details which will help me identify how, what type of uh, Loaners, I have. Uh, if I should, uh, if if I can analyze the trend, if I need to uh, approve my loans, uh, loan requests in the future or not. So I have all those data set, and I'm going to display uh, my raw DF. I already have this running uh, because of the essence of time. Uh, so I'm going to explain the results and the query. So as you can see that. Uh, because we have display function in Databricks, I'm able to uh, look at the table view of my data. So we have loan status, as I mentioned, uh, it's either fully paid current and there are other statuses as well. Um, and then interest rate. Um, so I'm gonna, as a data analyst or data scientist, I am interested in looking at what columns I have and what what columns I can select for my featureization or maybe uh, as a predictive uh, input variable, etc. So uh, taking a quick glance at it, uh, I have interest rate revolving utilization. So it's a good, uh, good column to use for uh, understanding the credit, how people are spending the credit. Uh, now I notice that the issue date of loan and uh, credit line are in the month and year format. And for me to predict uh, or to make a better predictive model, it would be helpful for me to uh, separate out the uh, year. So that's one of the things I can do in my data uh, transformation. Uh, then I see that there is em uh, employment length, which is a, a good factor to consider when you are um, measuring the credit score. Uh, verification status, total payment. All right, uh, then I have loan amount. Cool. So I pick some of the uh, variables for my analysis and, and I know what uh, transformations I need to do for my data, um, for my machine learning model. Uh, also, this loan status can be a feature, uh, can be a feature, uh, featureized vector uh, for my machine learning model. So what I'm going to do is change it to a binary digit. 
uh, sorry, change it to a value where I can either have a bad loan or good loan categorization. So I'm going to do that in my transformation. So after looking at the data, now I'm going to apply some transformations to my data. This is a step after uh, you have your data. So I'm going to use SQL functions. Uh, PySpark provides a lot of SQL, uh, a lot of functions that uh, are available for data transformation. So that's why I'm importing that library. Here I'm using clean uh, TF because I want to transform my data. So it's more meaningful when I'm doing analysis in my, uh, uh, when I'm doing analysis in my uh, next step. So out of raw data, what I'm doing is filtering out uh, some of the, some of the columns. As I mentioned, I'm going to use a uh, loan status and create a column if it's a bad loan or if it's a good loan. And how I can say that it's a bad loan or a good loan is, you know, any good loan is either paid off, default or charged off. And whatever is remaining, for example, delinquent loans or not paid loans, they are categorized as bad loans. So that's what I'm creating here. Uh, and then for, uh, some of the columns, as I mentioned, there were month and date. This is what I'm doing. Uh, I'm applying some transformations to uh, replace the integers and then change it into the date format. And again, I'm applying some transformations for other values which are useful for identifying the credit scores and credit um, and approving credit for uh, the loan uh, requesters. So I'm going to trim down some of the um, some of the data values. As you know that whenever you have data, you need to do data cleaning as well. So this is the step for data cleaning. So once I have that, I am actually going to create a view so that I can use that throughout my notebook to uh, query the results as well as use it for uh, creating more uh, tables. So after I run this, I am going to see that I have issue year and earliest year as well as credit length in years. What I did is um, I actually subtracted issue year minus earliest year to, to get this value. So as you can see that after I apply transformation, I have new columns created here. Bad loan trigger, either true or false, issue year, earliest year, credit year in length. So I applied my transformations. I have data ready for my uh, uh, next step. So now what I want my data scientists to get from the data is, uh, is the transactionality, is data lineage, right? As I mentioned earlier, data Delta Lake is a key enabler for uh, improving uh, reliability of your data. That's why I want to make sure my data scientists can work on uh, reliable data. So what I'm doing is, um, these are just the basic uh, utilities. In case if I if I was demoing this, I can delete this existing files. That's why I have it here. Uh, but mainly, what I'm doing is creating a database called Delta Lake database, and uh, this is the location I'm providing. So it can read from uh, it can write to this location, and then I'm going to create a Delta Lake table using Delta. So. Uh, to create a Delta table, you can use uh, Delta format. And also like within, uh, within Databricks, you can uh, do using CSV, using Parquet, if you have files in other formats, and then you can convert it into Delta. Uh, another cool functionality is uh, describe details. So this, al this function allows me to understand some of the metadata of my files. So after I run describe detail, I want to show you how metadata information is useful for either data engineers or data analysts. For example, they might be interested in seeing what format I have uh, for my data. So data is my format. It also allows you to see like which databases, uh, database has my uh, data uh, tables in, uh, and then location created at last modified. So all of these statistics are made possible uh, by Delta. And you can also see size and types. All right, so I'm going to do exploratory data analysis first, so that I can understand um, you know, some of the uh, some of my uh, data values as well as like 
what type of trends uh, might uh, what type of uh, you know analysis i can do with the data so i'm going to first create a count of loans data because i want to know how many rows i'm dealing with so count is uh, count is the first thing i'm going to do for exploratory data analysis uh, so it looks like i have around 650k uh, rows and then i want to view my delta table i want to see you know the number of loans across us how many loans have been uh, taken so it looks like california has a lot of loans and then texas and then there is somewhere a uh, dark area in new york and then in florida so these are some of the pointers i could see right from the get go of data exploration now to further um, to further see drill down in my data i want to see what types of loan these are so i can see that uh, you know the purpose, if i use a purpose i would be able to see what type of loans people are taking from my bank so debt consolidation seems to be the highest and this is why people are taking loans second highest is credit card uh, so people might have credit card debts so this allows me to see like you know some uh, some trends like why people take loans and then uh, i'm going to skip this one uh, this is just showing you uh, you know the location of delta uh, oh one important thing i would like to call out is uh, delta log this is where delta is able to provide you the linear information this is where it stores the historical context all the checkpoints of your data data versioning etc data versioning is very important because you will be able to see at what point of time my data changed and what changed in my data so it's a very uh, uh, powerful uh, utility for your uh, data pipelines and then uh, i'm going to show asset transactions uh, as well as like you know how you can integrate batch and uh, streaming together so in the next few cells what i'm showing is concurrent uh, streaming and batch queries uh, this notebook will uh, run an insert command every 2 seconds this is where i'm i am uh, looping creating a loop for my uh, 2 minute uh, 2 second data intervals and then we will run two queries concurrently against data and we will see how it works together all right uh, so now I'm going to create a table called loans aggregation delta, and then uh, I'm going to select address and count of loan uh, from uh, from my data frame, and then I'm going to assign it uh, assign it um, a different table name. So once I do that, I'm going to see the aggregated part, uh, and here I I want to use my uh, address date and some of the loan count so so here you can see that uh, when we try to run this uh, i will just run this to show you what it looks like so because i'm not displaying anything that's why this uh, i'm getting this result and then will get the data aggregation path and then i'm going to start the read stream and create a temporary view once i have that i will group by address state and then this is where the stream gets initialized you must have heard about actions and transformations so i am creating an action here on my data by creating a read stream. So as you see, as soon as I have uh, this read stream run through, it is going to give me a cool dashboard. So this is another functionality in Databricks. Whenever you have any streaming uh, application, you can you can see real time uh, inputs, how, how the streaming is happening. So uh as i let it run for a little bit it will uh it will change here the input results because as i mentioned uh, we are running this every two seconds all right so once we do that uh, i am going to do that in the loop so what i'm doing here i'm creating a loop of time every two seconds so that 
um, so that our data changes a little bit and we are able to see the noticeable difference. Um, what another thing I've been doing is I want to insert a value of Iowa because maybe I forgot to add the value. I don't see this Iowa in my data yet. So I'm going to insert that. And then once this runs, it will allow uh, this operation to happen. And then, uh, and then I want to review the results. So here I'm updating a value. For example, in your, um, in your data project, what happens if you all of a sudden realize that, oh, uh, this row contains the wrong value. Delta allows you to update the columns so that uh, you can update uh, a specific columns. You can set, set a specific value of uh, what row you are trying to alter. So here in my loans aggregate delta, I am actually setting my loan count to 126K for the state of uh, Washington. As you can see, after running this, Washington is changed. And to compare it to my earlier value, I don't have a significant value of Washington. It's 140, uh, it's 14,000. And here my Washington value has changed from 14,000 to 126,000. That was a significant um, change. Um, another cool thing that you can do in uh, Delta Lake is merge. What happens if, you know, uh, if there are missing values, if all of a sudden you realize that some of values, uh, some of the rows are missing and those are critical for your, uh, for your project. Delta allows you to do merge into operations so that you can, uh, you can predict the model better or maybe you can have a better recommendation model, something like that. So here I'm showing you how you can merge uh, different uh, rows. So I, here I have items which are IA and zero. These are the values for address state as well as uh, loan count. So I'm going to show you how after running this merge command, I am able to see this in the in my uh, result. So here I see that Washington still has 126K value. Okay, I changed California to 25,000. So yes, my California value changed to 25,000. If you remember from the earlier graph, our value of California was somewhere in six digits. Yes, it was 100,000. Uh, 100, so it drastically reduced that's why i'm able to see the change um so you you see how powerful it is to you know run the updates and merge on the fly and if you want to delete for example delete is very powerful when you may have me made a mistake in your data or maybe if there is a gdpr or ccpa law which requires you to delete some information of pii data um those are, are really uh extreme use cases, but here, uh, just to perform a simple delete, I'm gonna delete from loans aggregate uh, where address equals to Washington so that all my data for Washington gets removed. You can see that there is no loans from Washington. All Washington looks good, they are all paid off. Um, cool. And then uh, Delta also supports schema evolution. Uh, if you look at Delta Lake, it doesn't do schema evolution, uh, but in uh, Delta, you can. So what I'm doing here is selecting the columns and then um, uh, I'm adding like, you know, what format I want these columns to be in. And then I'm going to update one of the columns. So earlier I only have address date here, address date and loan count. I don't have loan amount and I want to add a loan amount column. So I evolved the schema of the table. I added a amount column here. So I'm going to show you how, uh, how different states have a uh, varied amount of loan in total. Looks like Texas has the highest amount of loan uh, taken from our bank. Um, and then uh, another cool feature is traveling back in time. As I mentioned earlier, uh, because Delta provides transactional um, uh, transactionality and versioning, uh, you will be able to travel back in time either for just the auditing or maybe to do rollbacks. So here, uh, you know, describe history allows you to see what exact versions have uh, been 
um, modified in my table. I can see that I have zero to 14 versions. It also shows you timestamp, which is pretty cool because you can see when my data was changed. You can also see the user which changed your data and what kind of operation they perform so that you can uh, catch any bad records or you know, quality, do quality control on your data. And then uh, operation parameters, usually these are very uh, helpful when you are doing like performance benchmarking or it can be useful in variety of uh, use cases. Uh, and then it also shows you what notebook changed, cluster ID that performed it, et cetera. So uh, pretty cool function of describe utility. And then to restore my version, what I can do is select star from my table and then what version uh, as of I want to retrieve. So because I made a lot of modifications after my version six, I will um, resume my version six here. So you can see that California is six digits now. This is the initial original uh, number of loans that California had. Washington still has 14,000. So I rolled back all of my changes that I performed to my table. Um, so that was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that's all. This uh, demo was basically to show you how you can perform different functionalities, uh, different operations on your data, as well as how you can prepare your, uh, your uh, data, uh, data lake house. After you, you prepare uh, your data pipeline, this is now ready for um, downstream applications. For example, data scientists can maybe run a, classify, a classifier model um, or do a futurization. Uh, yeah, so that's about it. Great. And um, then, yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Vinny. That, that's, that's great. We, we want to spend our, our last few minutes in the presentation addressing any questions that um, people in the audience have. So if you do have a question, you can either post it in the, the Q&A panel tool below, uh, or you can use the raise hand uh, tool, and I will enable your mic so you can ask your questions directly uh, for Vinny. Um, the one question that, that is there is from Anonymous, what's the best way to, to get familiar with Databricks? The last uh, handful of times I looked into it, it wasn't cheap to learn the platform. Any advice, Finny? Yeah, uh, very, a very good question. Um, as, I am, uh, as I'm a developer advocate at Databricks, I do want people to learn and leverage whatever free resources we can. So this is one of our ways to uh, extend our support for the community by providing guest lectures or tech talks. Please do take a check out our tech talks. I have posted it in my LinkedIn. Uh, uh, so, you know, there are there is also our YouTube channel for Databricks. So if you want to learn uh, anything in Databricks, we have a lot of demos about the platform as well as how you can start with the computer sources. And there are also educational materials around how you can, um, because you mentioned it wasn't cheap to learn the platform. I want to mention that, you know, there are a lot of ways. Uh, we have notebooks there. We also have a GitHub repo, which you can just, just uh, you know, fork and start running with the Databricks platform. And then community edition is the best way, or you can use our trial version with AWS. So stay tuned. Um, we do bring a lot of educational content to the community. And if you have any requests to, you know, learn something, just let me know. I will, um, I will do a tech talk or something because we do have that running all the time at Databricks. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Vinny. I, I also posted something oh. into the chat, just like a, a, a getting started uh, docs link that I believe was shared um, last year in one of the, in one of the, um, the presentations. Um, but that's, that's, that's great advice. Uh, there's, there's another question in the Q&A. Do you have any advice for anyone who wants to get into AI or data science in general? So that's a, a big question. Any advice for them? Yeah, uh, so I have a lot of cool advices of what I have seen across uh, uh, what data people do is, first of all, you are attending this class. That means uh, you already are in the program, I believe. Uh, this is a great way. Second uh, advice I would give is, even when I was in my academics uh, academics uh, journey, I would do the Coursera courses, or I would do like uh, you know some YouTube content or you know a bootcamp. I think there are some data professionals I have seen who 
just who do, who don't have data degree but they do the boot camps and they get started with it and also like i personally found kaggle very useful uh, just look at some open source project and start uh, iterating as i mentioned in my lecture um, start small and iterate on it you don't have to think about big picture you have a lot of data access now available to you so just pick any data set and try to iterate on it to build your profile and you know you can update it on your linkedin and uh, yeah i hope that advice uh, is helpful that's that's great advice thanks vinny uh, jimmy who is a, a course lead uh, for our machine learning at scale uh, has a question jimmy i just un, um, like you know let you let you use your mic so great yeah thanks very much thanks vinny for a great talk and as drew mentioned um, I, I developed a course on large scale machine learning, and we actually use Databricks as um, one of the platforms for uh, um, looking at data at scale, graph data, and, and also uh, building big data machine learning pipelines. So that's a plug for other people who want to get into Databricks and, and, and large scale machine learning. But um, I had a question. Um, so great talk. Uh, thank you for sharing all this. Um, so ML Flow. So how is MLflow doing these days? Is it, is it mature enough as a product? Uh, are, are there lots of, is there a lot of traction out there? And, you, and case studies maybe that maybe you could share? Yeah, um, so that's, that's a very a good question. And, and I absolutely want to thank you for doing the courses on Databricks. That's awesome. MLflow is being widely used. And as you can, uh, I don't have slides with me, but I can share. Um, it has evolved over time. We started very small. Uh, now it has over like I don't have the numbers, but uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty much used in like production pipelines for machine learning for Databricks customers as well as a lot of people are using open source MLflow um, to get um, you know to get tracking, experimentation, projects, and then we have evolved over to um, you know using MLflow models in the last year and soon we will be releasing uh, the deployment as well. Um, so we only can make this progress when community has uh, adopted it. Um, I will share the numbers once I have it handy, but I have seen, a, um, seen MLflow being used in our production applications, yeah. That would be great, Vinny. And I have one other question and that is around deep learning. And so maybe could you comment on deep learning and how that works with uh, Databricks and Spark in general. Um, just wanted to get, get a sense of where things are today. Yeah, uh, good question. So uh, recently I have seen a lot of deep learning use cases around uh, vehicle trafficking or uh, sorry, vehicle, uh, vehicle data, food traffic data, as well as like IOT sensor uh, industry and, you know, uh, uh, some of our customers are using it for identifying cancers. Um, so there is, if you are using Databricks, uh, there is a, a lot, uh, there is a runtime called uh, ML Runtime GPU. That's what uh, that's what is being used for neural networks and deep learning. And also, we facilitate a lot of uh, you know open source libraries into our product. As I said. Uh, we try to provide managed platform for any uh, latest tools. So please do check that out. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Thank you so much. Yes, James. Thanks for your questions. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Vinny. Uh, any other questions for Vinny? Okay, well, I just want to say thank you so much, Vinny, for sharing your thoughts, your experience with us, and for walking through the, the great demo, Lake House and, and Delta Lake based applications. I also want to say a big thanks to Databricks for hosting this lecture series. Uh, please do uh, keep your eye out for our next in the series, which is planned for later this term. I want to say thank you to Tia Foss and Rob Reed for organizing these events, as well as Gary Morphy Lum for the Zoom support. And finally, I want to thank uh, everyone in the audience for joining us today. Um, the recording of the presentation will be posted on the events page of the iSchool website, website in the next uh, week or two. So, um, and I'll post an announcement on Slack once it's up. Um, thanks so much, everybody. Uh, take care. Yeah, thank you, Drew. And I loved amazing audience interaction. Uh, please feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. And uh, if you can connect with me, I can uh, post the resources that you have asked for. Yeah, thank you all.